Okay, so in this tutorial, what we're going to go through is how to add Kotlin support to a problem. So at present, all problems in the library have to start with a Java solution. So you have to write the Java solution first. Once that's done, though, I would encourage you to add Kotlin support for the problem alongside the Java support. We haven't been doing this as we go. Um, you can also do it for an existing problem. So what I'm going to do is rather than write a new problem, I'm going to show you how to add Kotlin support to two existing problems. Um, and, and we'll see how to do that. So essentially, the process is very similar to how you set up a Java problem. You have to provide a description and a solution. And the only thing that's a little bit different is that we already have a solution in Java. So there's this question of like kind of where does the Kotlin solution go and how do you, how do you indicate that it is a Kotlin solution? And I'll walk you through that process. Um, one thing to note is that the description between the two questions can and frequently does vary. Uh, Kotlin, so I've, as I've been, you know, uh, updating our small problem library in Java, which has about 250 problems in it right now, I've been um, adding Kotlin support and I have not found a problem that I can't support in Kotlin. Well, actually, that's not true. Um, Kotlin doesn't allow you to use bare interfaces, and we do that in a few problems that use like comparables. So there's some places where I've had to kind of write a different version of the problem for Kotlin. But most of the time, this is straightforward. Um, so, but at the same time, sometimes the Kotlin description is a little bit different. In fact, frequently it's very different, right? The names of the primitive types are a little bit different and stuff like that. So you really do need a different description, but um, let's get started. So let's, let's choose something easy. Uh, we'll start with add one. So I'm gonna show you how to add Kotlin support to a question that uses uh, just a method, and then we'll do it for a, a class-based question as well. All right, so here's my add one question. Uh, here's what it looks like in Java. This is a really nice, simple, very compact uh, example of a question using Questioner. Um, and so what I need to do for Kotlin is add a Kotlin solution and add, um, add the description. And the question is, where do I put this? So what I'm gonna do in my typical convention, and you can put this anywhere because we're gonna use an annotation to mark it, but my typical convention is I create um, a sub package called correct.kotlin. Now, one of the things the questioner allows you to do is if you want, you can actually add other correct solutions in Java as well. So you can actually, you have one, you need to have one correct solution that's used as the reference solution in order to establish the behavior that the testing code is expected to match. But you can also use, uh, add other uh, correct solutions. And this becomes important, particularly when we start to use libraries. So we'll talk about that a little bit later when we uh, talk about some problems that start to use libraries because the idea is that Questioner limits the access of um, code that's submitted to libraries that are used by the solution. So if there's multiple ways to do things, um, sometimes you need to write a couple of different solutions that represent those different approaches so that all the libraries that a student might need to use in their approach are available. And there's other ways to actually whitelist things as well. So we'll cover that later. But uh, So I, I added this uh, sub package correct.col and if I had some correct other correct Java solutions, I would put them in correct.java, right? Um, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a Kotlin class in here, right? So I'm gonna call this question, um, and it's gonna create a class for me. Now there's, there's two ways to do this, okay? Um, so, and what does it have said about here? Uh, oh, the new line stuff, okay. I should fix that, it's a little bit irritating. Um, I, I will actually adjust this. This is, this is from a tool that we use called Detect that is, that is irritated with this, but it's, it's actually fine. Um, okay, so just like I did with uh, Java, I need to provide a description. Uh, so I'm gonna just add that here. Now, again, you know, it's tempting to cut and paste things and that can be a good starting point, but keep in mind, Kotlin is different. Um, so Kotlin, you know, the int type is named capital int. Um, uh, other than that, this is pretty simple, okay? And what we do to tell Questioner that this is also a solution to the problem is we use this also correct annotation, right? So I mark it, uh, this is taking a minute to build the list, uh, also correct, right? Uh, I mark this and then, you know, sometimes what I do when I'm feeling particularly lazy is I just grab the uh, Java solution and I cut and paste it in here. And Kotlin will actually, IntelliJ will ask you if you just want to automatically um, reformat the, um, the code, and in this case, uh, this works fine. Now I have this, um, I'm gonna actually disable this for you so you won't actually uh, run into this problem. So, because again, we don't need these unused inspections as part of this because, you know, anyway. Um, okay, so now I have Kotlin support, right? Let's try running this problem. So I'm gonna go back here. Um, now, actually, let me uh, talk a little bit about some of the run configurations that we have available. So we've been using this test focused 
And that's a good way to do things. If you're working on one problem, you add focus to the correct tag, and then that will just test that problem. And you can focus multiple problems at the same time, right? Um, I can also, though, run this one that says test unvalidated. And this will detect which questions have changed. So I, I had validated all the questions before we started this tutorial, but now I made a change to this question, and so I need to revalidate it. And so when I run this test, what should happen is that questioners should identify that this particular problem has changed, and it should rerun the validation process. Um, and this is going to do two things. First of all, it's going to add Kotlin support, um, and also it's going to uh, mark that this is a solution, um, and we'll see that in the report, right? So, oh, and it looks like maybe I didn't revalidate all the questions. Okay, I, I must have forgotten. Um, all right, so it looks like there's a couple that needed. Oh, you know what I did? I reformat this stuff. Anyway, sorry. So now if I run this again, uh, I just want to show you when I run test unvalidated, now that those questions have been validated, right? Um, what's going to happen is it's still going to think for a minute if it says no unvalidated questions found. Okay, let's look at the report for our uh, question here now. Um, and again, I'll just open it over here to the side in IntelliJ. First of all, you see that there's a tag up here that indicates that there is Kotlin support, right? Which is pretty cool. Um, and you'll see also that now there's a solution uh, for Java. You'll see that there's a description and a solution both for Java and for Kotlin. Let me close this so we can see more what happened, right? Um, and so, and this is again, the code that we would expect students to write. You'll notice that when you set up a question in Kotlin, if the starter code wrapped the method, that is also done to the Kotlin code, right? So you'll see that the, the questioner automatically identifies this as a question where we're gonna do some templating, and we're gonna take that uh, method and put it into a class template. And so it automatically strips that away from the Kotlin solution. Now, if you're into Kotlin, like I'm into Kotlin, one of the cool things about it is that in Kotlin, you can actually write top level methods. So we actually don't need to follow, now you can follow this convention, you can just write a class and put the method inside and it'll just work, right? Um, but there's another option here. So let me show you what the other option is. The other option is to essentially remove this top level class, okay? Um, and now I still need to mark that this file contains a solution. Um, but the way I can do that, and this is really only applicable to Kotlin, is that the also correct annotation can also be applied to a file. And this is how you do it. You just, you know, um, at file colon also correct. So now this marks this file as containing a solution. And essentially any methods that are defined in the top level of this file will be uh, used by, by questioner. Uh, so let's try this again. I'm going to run unvalidated. I've made changes to the files that comprise this particular problem. So my testing tool is going to identify that. It's going to rerun the tests and hopefully this is going to pass again. It's just a slightly different way to set up the problem if you would rather not be reminded of the fact that uh, Java forces you to write these top-level classes and Kotlin doesn't. So here's another way to do it. Right? Again, you know, six of one, half dozen another. Do which one uh, works for you. The, the way that the solution looks to the student is no different, right? You know, again, you can see from the report, they write the same code, right? Okay, cool. So that's how to do a, uh, a, a, a Kotlin support for a, uh, for a, 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 a method-based problem. Let's look at a class-based problem, right? So I have a, another one over here. That's my counter object, okay? Now with classes, sometimes, you know, the, the process is basically the same, right? I do new package, I'm gonna do correct.kotlin. Uh, I'm gonna add a new, come on. I'm gonna add a new uh, Kotlin class called counter. Um, I'm gonna mark it as correct. Uh, right? And then I just need to duplicate the code that I wrote here. Now here, things get a little bit trickier, right? Because for example, you know, in the way that we set up classes in Kotlin, it's a little bit different, right? Uh, and so you have to think a little bit harder about how to create a Kotlin class that behaves the same way as the Java class does, right? So this Java class defines a single constructor. In Kotlin, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, we're gonna essentially have to do the following. So let's see if I can actually set this up properly, right? It's been a little while since I practiced this, right? So this is going to be a private val, um, let's see. And, and the names here, um, you know, the names here aren't super important, right? So, uh, well, actually the names are important. So that's actually, ooh, wow, okay. I almost blew it there. 
The names are important, right? Because remember, Kotlin is going to try to automatically, in certain cases, Kotlin is going to try to automatically generate getters and setters for us that are accessible from Java, and it uses the convention get name. So when you write code in, in Java, you pick both, you can, by convention, pick both the private name of the variable and the name of your getters and setters. So there's no need, you can have a variable named foo, and you can have a getter named get value and a setter named set value, right? Usually we name them so that they match, but there's no requirement that you do so. When you set up a Kotlin class, there is, right? Because the for, for a public val or var, the getters and setters are going to be set for us, right? Now, this is a private val, so that's okay, right? So I'm going to say private val uh, value int, right? Because this is now, remember, when I declare a class in Kotlin, this is now the primary constructor. So I'm going to end up with the primary constructor that accepts a single int parameter and sets this uh, private val, okay? Um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, I've got increment, decrement, and get value, right? So I can say um, fun get value uh, return value, right? Uh, I could mark this as an int, right? This returns an int. And then I have fun increment. Uh, this is going to be value plus plus and fun decrement value minus minus. Um, and it's upset about this for some reason. Oh, right. This is a variable. Not a bad. Okay, cool. Um, and there's probably other ways to set this up too, right? Um, one way, you know, uh, one way you could do it actually, we could do something like this. Um, we could do set value, and then we could say, uh, and then we could set up a uh, let's see here, private. Um, let's sit, let's do this. We'll do uh, do do do. Their value is equal to set value, and then we do uh, private set. Right? So this will now only provide a getter. It's mad because I provided a getter with the same name. Now it works. So this would be another um, this would be another way to do this. And actually, in this case, I don't need to mark this as a val. It's just a constructor parameter, right? Um, so you know, there's a couple of different ways to to to, to do this, right? Um, let's just go with this one for now and see if it works. Um, but you know, again, the the translation from Java classes to Kotlin classes is frequently a little bit trickier than it is with uh, just a method. I have actually not tried just automatically translating it. Maybe we'll do that in a second uh, and see how well that works, right? That, that might be kind of fun, um, but it's usually kind of fun, particularly if you're learning Kotlin to kind of use this as a chance to practice. Okay, I also need the, um, the description. And this is another place where, again, we're gonna start by cut and pasting, but we're gonna we gotta do some thinking here, okay? Um, first of all, you know, in, in Kotlin, we don't use public. Right, uh, because the classes are, are public by default, so we just say define and implement a class counter. Right um, now, now here's here's where things get interesting. Right, it should say you know a, co a counter should provide a uh, primary constructor that accepts an int parameter. Um, and oh wait, hold on, did I? Ooh, wow, look at this. There's a there's a bug. <laughs> See, I told you it was really important to keep these in sync. Right, uh, this should be called get value, right? That returns the stored value, right? Uh, rather than get count, uh, so we'll call this get value. Okay, um, so now this is going to work. I have a primary constructor that accepts an int parameter, right? Whether or not I mark that in the primary constructor declaration as a as a var, val or a var, or just allow it to be a primary constructor parameter that's used to set a var, as in this example. Um, that doesn't matter, right? Um, but you know, you just have to go through these a little bit and make sure. Oh, here's another example, right? So returning void, uh, returning unit, right? Um, you know, and I should mark this over here as being a type, right? Just put it in the okay, uh, because in again, you know, Kotlin doesn't have a void type. Kotlin methods that don't return something return unit. Um, okay, so other than that, this looks correct. Um, you know, and, and you know, this uh, might, might you know, students could provide a get value method the way that we did previously that just returns the value, or they can set up this type of, um, uh, you know, property and, you know, expect Kotlin to prepare, to prepare the class properly with the get value method for them. Okay, so let's test this again. This, this uh, class should now be marked as unvalidated because we've made some changes. So let's give it a go. Water bottle's empty, that was like a totally fake drink, right? I am thirsty a little bit, but there's no water in there. So I'll go get water in a second. Okay. 
All right, good. So, and actually one of the things you'll notice here is in this little blip that's printed when the validation finishes, there is something that says whether or not it supports Kotlin or not. So you can use this as a little hint to make sure that you got things right. Uh, I would still encourage you though to open up the report uh, to make sure that things worked out the way we thought. Now we have a Kotlin solution, right? And this is the Kotlin description and we can go through and make sure that looks okay. And then here's our solution. But again, there, there are multiple different ways that students could use to solve this problem. Um, if you, there, there are some things that we do to try to accommodate Kotlin um, in our testing uh, library, in the underlying testing library. There are some sort of interesting changes that Kotlin makes to the class layout that we try to work around uh, for students. And so if you have questions about that as you're trying to design Kotlin equivalents for some of your Java classes, please you know, ask, right? And, and I can help guide you in the right direction. Um, but in most cases, this is pretty straightforward. Okay, so we've added Kotlin support now to our add one uh, method and to our, um, to our uh, counter object class, right? And this gives you an example of how to add Kotlin support in both of these cases. The other thing I've pointed out here is this use of this also correct annotation. And this is something that you can use in other places. So if you have a piece of Java code that you want to make sure is also represents another alternate solution and you want to include that as part of the problem, you can do that. Use the same annotation, put it somewhere in there, mark it with also correct. In the case of an extra solution for Java or Kotlin, you don't have to provide another description, right? Just provide the also correct annotate the class. This again becomes more important when we start to look at um, uh, submissions that use imports, right? And, and we can talk about that in a later tutorial.